Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles. We're talking about blood covenant. We've been speaking on the, on the subject of blood covenant now for a few weeks and uh, in, in an effort to get into the authority of the believer. And, uh, but we, uh, what I thought was going to be a real simple two or three service thing has turned down to five or six, maybe seven. That happens with me. Yeah, maybe until Jesus comes. No, we're getting, we're getting closer to the end. Hallelujah. Last week, as we talked about, the new covenant was not made with us. Jesus, God did not make a covenant with us. He made with Jesus. We enter into that covenant through our relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember, Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, and in Galatians 2.29 says this, If you be Christ, that's possessive, apostrophe S, then are you Abraham's seed. Remember, he said back up and earlier in that same chapter, he said, he said not the seeds as of many, but seed as of one, which is Christ. The promise was made to Abraham and to his seed. Okay? All right? And then, that, and then 29 says, And if you be Christ, possess, you're possessed by Christ. Hallelujah. Then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What was the promise that God made to Abraham? Uh, I'll bless you and bless you and, and multiply you and multiply you. Wayman says, um, uh, I will bless you and bless you and increase you and increase you. So the blessing of Abraham was the blessing of multiplication and increase. Blessing and multiplication and increase. God wants us blessed. Amen. But remember, we're talking about covenant. Everything that has to do with what we're talking about, it has to be viewed from a covenant mindset. Why? Because if you don't view it from a, if you, from a covenant mindset and view it from a sugar daddy mindset, you'll get an error. God's my sugar daddy. No, he's not. God's not your sugar daddy. God is the God of the covenant. I am the Lord that keepeth covenant even to a thousand generations. God has done everything he's done with man since the fall of man through covenant. Adam, when he fell, we refer to what God did with Adam as the Adamic. Uh, some people say Adamic because they think it sounds like they're custom, but they're not. It's properly pronounced the Adamic covenant. Okay? The covenant between God and Adam. He slew the animals, shed their blood to cover their sin, and cover, them with the skin, and cover their nakedness with the skins of the animals. Okay? So there was a covenant with God and Adam. There was a covenant with God and Moses. There's a covenant with God and, and Abraham. There's all kinds of covenants God made in the Old Testament, but the one in the final covenant was with Jesus Christ. It's the new and the better covenant established on better promises. Glory to God. I said glory to God. We enter into that covenant through our faith in Jesus Christ, and we are now to be covenant mindset, have a covenant mindset. What do you mean not calling them sugar daddy? Well, you got people who run around. Uh, we talked about this earlier in teaching, that how when Stanley and Livingston traveled across Africa, and that's where a lot of the understanding of covenant came from, um, that, you know, they cut, uh, I forgot, over 50 covenants with different tribal leaders over Africa for, for supplies, for protection, for different things. And um, if you've never read the book by H. Clay Trumbull, um, The Blood Covenant, it's, it is a scholarly reading. Okay? In other words, it's very good. But it'll take you forever, okay? Well, that's great information, you know. So you need it. It's not one of those jump up and run around the room things, okay? Uh, Kenyon took his little mini book, and, and that was the foundation of his mini book, his teaching from that, okay? It was the blood covenant of H. Craig Trumbull, then Kenyon did his little mini book. Two together is really good, all right? <clears throat> but what they found out was that in, in making a covenant, the, 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 the one side would make a pronouncement of all the things they were going to do for you. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this. And then the other side will go, okay, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And the understanding and, the, and what was stated was everything that one had was the others, and everything that the other had was, the, was this one's. Their possessions became, they became joint heirs of the possessions of either party. That's how strong the covenant was. Well, it's the same thing with us. Remember, we're heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. You know what the Bible says? Okay, so we, we are joint heirs. So everything that God made promise to Jesus, we're, we're joint heirs to. Now, we have, a, in the charismatic word of faith circles, we love the blessing. I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going. I, we, quote Deut we can quote Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 14. Get to 15, it don't even exist. Because Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for curse, it's written curses everyone that hangeth on a tree. 
quite frankly, it probably is referring more to the fact that the law was given and the law itself was a curse in the sense that you, no one could obey it. Okay? And, we, and I, I'll preach it, you know. We get all the blessings without the curse. Amen. But we always want the blessings. So we follow narratives that teach us things like, it doesn't matter what you do, you're under grace, you're going to get blessed anyway. You're not covenant mindset if you believe that. You're not in a covenant mindset if you believe that. And we're in a covenant. When we came into the kingdom, look at Romans chapter uh, 10. When we came into the kingdom, when you were born again, when you received the life of God, when you entered into this covenant, folks, you did it. How? What saith it? Verse 8. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Now, many translations will, will say it this way, that Jesus is Lord. Okay? And believe in your heart God, that God's raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, we confess Jesus is what? Lord. You see, when God says, as for me, my covenant's with you. Or, I've made salvation available to every man. Woo! Yeah, we teach, what do we teach? That, that didn't just include getting saved. That includes getting healed. That includes prosperity. That includes deliverance. That includes preservation. Uh, preservation. That includes safety. That includes his protection. Oh, glory to God, it includes all the things. We teach on Sozo and Soterius, and we teach the Greek. You know, that the, the, the Schofield teaches all those things are included in that word salvation and Sozo and salvation. Amen. Glory. Amen. Wow, glory to God. Get it run around service time. I got it all. Hallelujah. And every bit of that's true. I said every single word of it's true. He has made a covenant with us and promised us all these things. I mean, I preached in a church service one time. A little old black man was there and he, he got up. I was preaching on the blood. And he got up and he just, he, go, he grabbed the holy edges. He, he couldn't hardly move. And he just stood there like this. <laughs> he was getting blessed, but that's all he could do. <laughs> and then right behind him was a lady, and she had a hanky out. <laughs> and the more she waved, it, the harder I preached. <laughs> to finally in the service, I was going like this. Because, <laughs> I mean, I, I was gone. I had nothing left in there. <clears throat> it's all true. Soterius, you know, with the, the, the noun sozo, the verb, you know, of, of being saved and, and salvation, having uh, saved, healed, delivered, made whole, preserved, glory to God, from temporal evils, glory, oh my God, it's good. That's the promise of God. But there's another side to a covenant. Our side. Oh, what am I going to promise to God? You confess him as Lord. You're my Lord. And in that confession, I submit everything, not just my money or my possessions, not just my 10% or a special little extra dabble do your Lord blessing here or there. Everything, my thought life, the actions, how I conduct myself all belong to him. And I honor him from my side of the covenant by walking in accordance with his heart and his will. You cannot take the narrative, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm under grace and going to heaven and be covenant-minded. I said this last week, I'm saying it again. I had to catch up Winston this morning so it's still fresh. You cannot live that way. You cannot live in fornication and drinking and adultery and, uh, and th stealing and all these kind of things and then run off and go, I'm under grace, I'm under grace. There's no condemnation. I'm not condemned. And be covenant mindset. And we're in a new covenant established on better promises, but we're in a covenant. God is covenant minded. So what does that mean to us? That my life, when I confess them as Lord, becomes His. In Him I live and move and have my being. We should sing that chorus, you know. 
in Him we live and move and have our being. And then we start, we get faster and faster. And so we can dance. Because every, every, you know, charismatics, we've got to dance. I mean, we, like, we think Bee Gees is our, is our theme song. You should be that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stuff just comes out sometimes, you know? I mean, church, we all you know, be dancing before the Lord. You know, we just run around the building. Hallelujah. Have us a Holy Ghost time. Glory to God. We love the blessings. We love the blessings. We love the blessings. And hallelujah. Thank God he made provision. Thank God we are in a dietetic covenant. We're in an unequal covenant because he's got all the stuff. He's got all the things we have need of. But to his heart, you're greater than all the things he gives you. Because he loved you so much he gave his only begotten son. Amen. Now, this is the love of the father. It is so great. His, the health, the prosperity, the blessings, all those things he gives for you that you think are so great pales in comparison to what he and his heart gets, and that's you. I said all the covenant blessings you, 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 you enjoy so much or think are so great. Healing, prosperity, the blessings of God, uh, houses, lands, whatever, pales in comparison to his heart's desire, which is you. God's heart is satisfied by having you. He's giving you all the other stuff. That's fine. How shall he who spared not his own son not also with him freely give us all things? He wants you blessed, but he gets you. And you are out of a covenant mindset if you think that you get all the blessings, he gets you, but you can do whatever you want to do, and it's still okay. Because if you really love the Lord, if you really honor the Lord, then you are not going to want to displease him. I said this way in this, in Winston this morning. A lot of things that judgment can't come on because people are holding on to it. And how, let's go to, we were going to pick up Psalm 91 this morning. Let's go to Psalm 91. I got to get there. We've got to read it. Then we'll go. All right. You know, sometimes I'm like sick of to a bulldog. I want to get somewhere and don't really want to have the journey to get there. <laughs> he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High and abide, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. Surely he will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. We're going to stop there. I will abide, what? He that dwelleth in the secret place. I'm going to make a statement to all these people who have a, a, an extreme grace narrative. I believe in grace. I believe in grace. It's, it's one of the most beautiful and powerful subjects in the Bible. But there are those who've hijacked it and turned it into licentiousness, just like Jude said. He said they've entered in and turned the grace of God into the lasciviousness, King James, licentiousness in the Greek. It's not good words. They've robbed it of its value and its purpose. Because they've used it to say, God's got a covenant on this side, he's going to give me everything. And over on my side, he just stamps grace, it don't matter what I do. That's wrong. We, are, we have to have a covenant mindset. The grace of God is understood in covenant. It is not a covering to do whatever you want to do. It is the empowerment and the sustaining and the ability to do as he wants you to do. Now, God says, come out from among them and, be, uh, and touch not the unclean things. Be separate and touch not the unclean thing. Be holy for I am holy. Amen. Be imitators of God as dear children. We all know that in the flesh it's impossible to do everything God wants you to do. That's where grace comes in. The Apostle Paul said that he, he had been given a thorn in the flesh that had buffeted him, and he sought the Lord three times and had removed from him. And he said, he said this, this. He said, my grace is sufficient for you for when you are weak, then are you strong. And Paul said, moreover, therefore, I will rejoice in my weaknesses or in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What did Paul just do? He told us in that case grace was power. He, he told you, grace is not, I know it's the, the traditional, really thin definition, undeserved, unmerited favor. Honey, when Paul's talking about the thorn in the flesh, undeserved, unmerited favor don't fit. And Paul tells us what it is. He said that when I'm weak, 
He said, I rejoice because then the power of Christ rests on me. When I'm in my weakest point, when I cannot do what I need to do, when I cannot walk the way I need to walk, there is a grace of power that infuses me and empowers me. And I'll prove it to you, Philippians 2.13. Run over there. Who's got an amplified here this morning? All right, I just, uh, you got it right there, Jeff? Get Philippians 2.13 amplified. Thank you, Ellie, but you don't, you don't have to come all the way up front now. Philippians 2.13 says uh, in the King James, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do good at his good pleasure, of his good pleasure. Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. Not, huh? Okay, thank you. He had, thank you. Not in your own strength. For it is God who is all the while effectively at work in you. What is this? Listen to this. Energizing and creating in you the power and desire. I am telling you, if grace is at work in your life, your desire is not to get away with sin. You're not looking for ways to get away with it. Right. You're not looking, you know, to be found out that first John 1, 9 doesn't belong to the believer. It's not even in the Bible. I don't have to repent. If you are, oh, they got people, they got people running around saying, all Greek scholars now agree that it's not even in the Bible. They got a couple of Bibles printed without first John 1, 9 in it because it fits their narrative. I do believe that there's a writing that says, you know, woe be to any man who takes away or adds to this book. Let him be cursed on Ephemia. Now, when you start taking scriptures out to fit a narrative, you are, you are walking in that accursed anathema thing. He's energizing and creating in you the power and the desire, both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. What is this, grace? It's strengthening grace. This is a grace. It's strengthening grace. So on your side of the covenant, I've committed to his lordship. He demands me to live a certain way. I can't do it in my ability, but there's a grace that will create the desire and the will to do it and the, and, and the power. Amen? Creating you the power and desire. Creating you the power and desire to will and to work for his good pleasure. Oh, glory to God. Now, that's grace. Grace is I demand you live a certain way. But, Lord, I'm running short of my ability. That's all right. My, my grace, my power comes on you. And it empowers you, creates a desire in you to do it that way. Amen. Not, there's no condemnation of those in Christ Jesus. I'm under grace. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm still going to be blessed. I've heard people say stupid stuff like that. I don't have to obey. I don't have to give. I don't have to submit. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to do this because I'm under grace. You're not covenant mindset. And this, the grace is not working in you. I say it is not working in you. I don't care what you say. And I don't care what people who on television say. It's not working in you. No, I'm in a covenant. And because I'm in a covenant, I've committed to him. I declared his lordship. His lordship over my life means he has the right to demand and command of me anything he desires. The thing is, I already do what he wanted. His moral code's in the Bible. Amen? I am not to come in, run around, do whatever I want to do, declare I'm not condemned, declare I'm under grace, and keep doing it. Because what are you doing? You're searing your conscience. And the more you sear your conscience, the more you'll think you'll get away with. I said the more you sear your conscience, the more you'll think you can get away with. And in the end, the judgment will come. And if you're holding on to it, you're going to get burned. A number of years ago, we had a situation where uh, our church got tore up, got messed, uh, got messed all up. And, um, and I'll be honest with you. I mean, I had a hard time with it. I was young. I, uh, forgiveness, I didn't even think about forgiveness. I thought about hitting. I was looking for opportunities to hit. I'd go over to Brother Hagen meet someone. They'd come and grab me by the arm and say, I love you, brother. I'm thinking, I'm going to slap you. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm telling myself, it's been a number of years. I've, I've, I've got over it. <laughs> How'd you get over it? Uh, brother Hagen. Preaching on love. That got me over it. 
My wife's elbow in my side after Brother Hagin preached on that. What's he going to do with that? No, shut up. Woman, I still want to hit him. But a afterwards, yeah, we were at a camp meeting that one year, a couple years after all this happened, and they were there. Uh, he was there with his wife and his uh, basement girlfriend. He was sleeping with, waiting for his wife to die from diabetes. She told me herself, she said, he would let me go into a diabetic coma, almost go into a diabetic coma. I'm right at the edge of it. And I'd be begging him to call the doctor, the ambulance. He'd say, just use your faith. He wanted her to die. That's not God. I wanted to hit him. I mean, there are times I would lay in bed at night visualizing the newspaper articles. <laughs> Local pastor knocks out traveling evangelist who messed up his church. Fight at Brother Hagen meeting in Winston Salem, you know, the, uh, on the word of cover, the word of faith. Raymond grad beats up non Raymond grad over church split. Oh, I, this all going through your head. So we can't meet Brother Hagen preached afternoon service. He never preached afternoon service. Still didn't, didn't ever heard him preach an afternoon service before that or after that. But he came in the afternoon and taught him walking in love. And my wife sits there with her little elbow. And Brother Hagen says, Yeah. When my faith don't work and things start going wrong, I check up on my love walk first. Wham! What's he going to do with that? He wouldn't let go of it. Like a sick him to a bulldog. I mean, he had a bone. He want a brand new bone. He won't let him go of it. He just talked talk love, talk on love, talk on love. And every time he said something about love and forgiving people, I got whacked. I said, I'm going to start wearing a flap jacket to church. Now my elbows hurt. Leave the Coliseum. Walk out there outside of the the meaning is 115 degrees in Tulsa, you know. You're not getting wet because the sweat's just evaporating. Had three block walk down to the Williams Center from the, con the Assembly Center down there. And, uh, and all the way there, she's got my hand, got the fingernails dug in. What you going to do with that? What you going to do? <laughs> See, you can, get, you can hold on to something to the point you can't let it go. Get back to the room, lay down. Whack! What you going to do? I guess I'm going to forgive him. But just give me a little bit. I've had this for two years. I've got to think about this a little bit longer. I knew I had to. But I wanted my justification. I wanted, uh, old country folks, I wanted my comeuppance. I wanted to be justified. And it wasn't long, you know, a few minutes I laid there and I, I said, Lord, Lord, <laughs> this is an act of faith. I forgive him. I forgive him for, for splitting the church. I, split, I forgive him for almost putting our... We were on the verge of bankruptcy. I mean, it, it, I mean, they said things about my wife. I'm telling you, people came over and mopped the house. They wanted to, wanted to come over and bless the pastor's wife. So they came over to mop. Then they, after all this started, started going there saying, she sat right there and watched us mop and didn't do anything. You offered to come do it. You wanted to be a blessing. Now that you're mad... She didn't, she was lazy. She sat there and watched you mop wife. You, you, you. Well, don't offer. And you know, it took my wife years to let anybody do anything for us. She didn't want anybody. I'll do it myself. They just give the devil something to use against them, to use, and use, get them in, in strife and whatever. She wished she wouldn't let anybody do anything. Even when we needed it. It won't happen. It took her a long time to get over letting people do stuff for us. And, um, but I, you know, finally I thought, Lord, I forgive him. And the next morning, here comes that man and grabs me about. I said, I love you, brother. And I turn around, and for the first time in two years, I didn't want to punch him out. I'm, I'm, you're talking about free. You're talking about our freedom. And this has been over 20 years. Yeah, I think about 20 years. Yeah, yeah. You know what happened? About two, three months later, he was caught in his office at 2 o'clock in the morning with his worship leader in adultery. Now, after all that came out, I wept. I didn't, I wasn't different, just I wept because of what happened to the people. Some went back on drugs. Some went back to jail. Some divorced. Some went back doing things they had done before they got saved. Because they, they, they were so, so de devastated by all the stuff of what happened with our church and then this. It, it just messed them up. And I wept. I didn't rejoice. I wept. Because good people who loved the Lord got messed up and got caught up in this. But then the Lord told me, after I heard about it, everything that happened, the Lord said, I could not judge it until you let go of it. 
because you were holding on to it, you would have got hit with it too had you not let go of it. I'm like, okay. I could not judge it. Now let me say this. You can't be sitting around in the presence of the Almighty, hello, abiding in the secret place, holding on to what he abhors and expect the blessings. We're to love God but hate sin. If you love God, you can't hold on to sin. Now, I didn't say you, that you can't ever make a mistake to sin because there's a provision when you do. If any man sin. Amen? If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Amen. The Lord is our advocate, but you cannot hold on to it. What do I mean hold on to it? Embrace it. We got Christians now who embrace drinking, fornication, all, all kinds of stuff. They embrace it under the guise that they're, they're under grace. It doesn't matter. And they'll tell you, oh, you're, you're, you're condemning me. I'm free. I'm not condemning you. You're holding on with the Lord of horse. And you're in covenant with God. He's made this promise. And you committed a lordship to him. His lordship over your life. He that abides in the secret place of the Most High, or he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What is it? Oh, we want the shadow. We want the protection. We want the money. We want the blessings. We want the healing. We want the multiplication. We won't be blessed when we lie down. We won't be blessed when we rise up. We won't be blessed when we got into the city. We won't be blessed when we go back out in the country. We won't be blessed in the field. We won't be blessed in everything we set our hand to. Blessed in our cattle and our kind and our vineyards, whatever it is. We won't be blessed. We want all the provision. But I'm a covenant man too. Therefore, my life is yielded to him. And his will, and let me say it, his moral code. Now, oh, no, brother, I went east left. Well, okay, what's the commandment of love? Come on, folks, what's the first part? Love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. Stop. God has a moral code. And if you love him with all your heart, your soul, and your strength, you're going to want to keep it. You're going to want to honor him. See, people come around, when they say love, they mean, you're, you're being mean by saying we shouldn't do such and such. You're being condemning. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm a covenant man. He's my Lord. I love him with all my heart, soul, and strength, meaning I'm not going to violate purposefully and then try to cover it up if I do. No. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Where does godly sorrow come from? The, the, the sorrow of displeasing the one you love with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. To dishonor and to displease him should bring a sorrow to your heart. Not just because the preacher got up and said, you're going to go to hell if you do it. And if you keep doing it, you might. Because they that practice such things will not receive the kingdom of God. Now that doesn't usually go over good in our circles these days. I didn't. I, I, just, I noticed that. Now, I, I got a lot of reflective looks. Okay. I'm messing with you right now. Hallelujah. When you love God and you're submitted to him, what does what what, what Romans say? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is a reasonable service. Amen? I, was, I, I went blank. I couldn't think of how it began. That verse 2 begins. Um, oh, well. I, went, I, went, I mean, talk about going totally blank. No, that's Romans 8. Romans 12, 2 says, be not, there we go. be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may do what? Prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Now, folks, if you think you can live like the world and know what the will of God is, you're sadly mistaken. 
You cannot continue to think as a covenant person that living how I want to live, which is always like the world. Right. I never see anybody says, I can live any way I want to live, who lives holier. They live more ungodly and justify all their ungodliness. See, the word be not conform, conforms just like a jello mold, fashioned and shaped. You know, y'all ever made jello important to the little molds, let it get hard, you know, well, not hard, but wiggly, and dump it out. Got a little castle there, or whatever, a little fish, whatever you made out of your little jello mold. Okay? Don't be fashioned or shaped or molded according to the world. I'm not to look like the world. I'm not to act like the world. Now, Jesus did not look or act like the world. I don't care what anybody says. You know, well, we've we got, we got to back off this stuff. We let people be, you know, because to reach the world, you've got to look like the world. No, you don't. Jesus wore rabbinical clothing. He ate with the publicans and sinners to minister to them. But he was still called rabbi, or he, rabboni, rabbi, teacher. He wore the clothes of a teacher. He didn't dress down and look like the people he was ministering to. Well, you've got to have gauges and you've got to have tats and you've got to have you know, chains running from here to there to minister to them. No, you don't. Now, I'm not saying if you've got that, you, you know, you're going to hell. I'm saying that I don't have to do that to be able to minister to you. Because right. Right. my chain from my nose to my ear doesn't break your, your, your yoke. The anointing destroys the yoke. Amen? Amen? And I can, be as, I can be the straightest, stiffest honky from, from the country you've ever met. <coughs> and the anointing will destroy the yoke in your life. Are you here? I mean, I can wear my button-down shirt buttoned up to the top with no, with no tie on. Plaid with striped pants. If you used to call them high waters. It's not being like you that's going to win you. Jesus was not like the publicans and sinners he ate with. Neither was he like the Pharisees that, he, that, that, that they abhorred. He walked in the authority and the power. Never have we heard anyone speak with such authority in their words, or power and authority in their words. But we have got to get back where was oh Romans? Be not conformed to this world. Don't be shaped. Don't be fashioned. Don't be. Mo what does that mean? I don't act like the world. We got Christ young Christians running around thinking it's all right to sleep together, and all right to drink. All they want to talk about is they can drink and they can have sex. Yeah. I'm sure the Lord gave you that revelation. <laughs> yes. His name is Beelzebub, yeah. the maggot lord. He's Lord of the flies, and see, flies come from maggots, so Satan is the maggot fly, Lord. That's right. That stuff comes out of the pit. And we've got our young people adopting this, and you've got preachers who will preach it because it gets them, it sells their books and sells their tapes and gets them to send them money, and they get rich off of it, and they're willing to sell the soul of those people in order to have the, the prosperity and the wealth and the image that they desire in life. And they will pay for it. God's not, God, God will not be mocked. I said, God will not be mocked. Be not conformed to this world. I came to Jesus so I could get out of the mess I was in, not stay in it. Be not conformed, but be ye transformed. Y'all know this, I've taught it, but I'll, for those that benefit may not have heard it. Transform comes from the Greek metamorpho. Metamorphosis. That's where we get our English word metamorphosis from. Our, we have a metamorphosis, what? We change the way we think. We no longer think and are governed by the dictates and desires of the flesh. As a born-again creature, as a man or woman who's born of the Spirit of God, who the life of God has entered into, and I've entered into a blood covenant by faith, glory to God. I, I now, by studying the Word of God, by renewing of your mind, by studying the Word of God, have a metamorphosis. Now I think of living out of my spirit. My spirit man's alive unto God. My spirit man's my God. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Hallelujah. 
I'm now in communion with the Father, Spirit, Spirit, the Spirit. Get to pray in tongues. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Get to communion with Him. And when I prove, listen, Romans 12, finish this up. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Now, because I live out of my spirit. My spirit wants to know what the word says I should do. Not skinny jeans and bedhead. I get tired of people, you know, because they, they, they're cool. They wear skinny jeans and have bedhead. You ain't going to catch me in skinny jeans. You might see me with bedhead, but that means you came to my house early in the morning. And if, quite frankly, if you come to my house early in the morning, I'm going to put a hat on. You still ain't going to see my bedhead. We think because somebody's on television, and because they're cool, and they say, God showed me. I don't, listen, I don't give a rip what they say God showed you. Can they prove it from here? And they bear up under the scrutiny of all Scripture, not just some isolated place. Because if I'm not pointing you to a lifestyle that moves you away from the things of the world and into the things of God, I'm not preaching the right stuff. If you don't have a stronger desire to leave the world behind, we used to sing that song. Nathan sang it every once in a while. Um, don't y'all you know don't just love Nathan and Dick? It's so sweet. The worship is so sweet. Yeah, we don't have drummers. We don't have you know, piano, but they're, they're worship is good. It is sweet. It's of the heart. Amen? Hallelujah. As Dick's write songs. Nathan writes songs. So you don't know which ones they are when they come out, but they're, they're in there. Hallelujah. You know, songs of the heart. Don't know where I was going with that. Huh? Now, we sing that old song. You know, I have decided to follow Jesus. 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 No turning back. No turning back. I'm telling you, a lot of times people come in with that kind of commitment. They confess his lordship and some preacher changes the way they think. Right. With a message and a narrative that takes them away from not to, so they turn back. Mm -hmm. I can drink and go to heaven. Mm -hmm. I can have sex with all the women I want to have it with and go to heaven. I can be homosexual and go to heaven. I can be a lesbian and go to heaven. Woo! It's better than peanut butter and sliced bread. Except the problem is, no, you can't. And they throw, well, you're under grace. It's okay. No, 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 no. It's, it's not okay. What's okay? I'll tell you what's okay. is a heart that pursues God. Jesus said all the law and the commandments, the prophets, hinge on love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. What happens? See, the first one is the most important because it keeps you looking to him and keeps you living right. The other one is, is relationship. Keeps you from stealing, robbing, mis mistreating your neighbor. In other words, you're showing them the love of God. Yeah. You're treating them the way God would treat them. Amen. We've done some. We've done some doozies. Now, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Some of the narrative of the, of the new hyper grace or extreme grace message is some of our righteousness teaching rehashed from the '70s and '80s. Because we got some people got teaching righteousness so strong that it didn't matter what you did, you were still righteous. I'm sorry, you don't need to teach things like that. Because we wouldn't teach the balance in scriptures because we thought we would, we would get people backing off. Did you know Paul, who preached righteousness, also said, don't yield your members as servants of unrighteousness, but as servants of righteousness? We're not to let... See? Over and over again, my covenant comes up, and God says this. Now, here's the thing. Now, this does not make you condemn, but the fact is... If God has a covenant with me, and I have a covenant with God, and he's told me, my strength, I'll strengthen you with my grace, I can pursue him with everything i got. I can love him with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my strength. When sin presents itself, I can say no. Even when my flesh is going, yeah, baby! Ow! I feel 
good. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, you know, oh! If you can't be with the one you love, honey, love the one you're with. Remember that song? Oh, yeah. You talking about the theme song for situational ethics. That's it. <laughs> can't be with the one you love, honey. Love the one you're with. And it's, I love that song. I don't love it. I loved it. The, the melody to it and, 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 and the way it was, it was structured chord-wise and all that, it was a great, I mean, just, it was a catchy song. Kind of like Stairway to Heaven is a catchy song. <laughs> Except it's a Satanist song. Because they believe that there's a back way, a stairway out of hell, and you go up to heaven after a certain while of partying all along. You know, there's a stairway to heaven, I'm finding. It. But that song, melodically, you just kind of go. <laughs> the world will entrap you with the dressings and the glitz and the glamour and then try to sell it to you under the guise that this is what God wants you to do. And it's not right. And, and then, who are you to condemn me? I'm not condemning you. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. You're a, you're a hate preacher. No, I'm not. You can call me a hate preacher. Just because I say homosexuality is one does not make me a hate preacher. As a matter of fact, I'm a love preacher. Because it will send you to hell. And the love of God constrains me to tell you that. Why? Because I want you to go to heaven. I want you to be liberated and be born again and know the love of God and go to heaven. I don't want you going to hell. I do not. But don't tell me, but you're a hate monger. Oh, that's just, see, the devil. I said, that's the devil. Amen. We're going to walk in covenant. And I'm going to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And in order to dwell there, I'm going to have to let go of God, those things God hates. I mean, I should want to. How many of you, before you got saved, wanted to get out of the mess you were in? Raise your hand. You just wanted to be out of the mess you were in before you got saved. You hated where you were. Okay? You came to the Lord. Why would you want to go back? Now, Egypt did that. Now, if you haven't heard it, go back about January of 2014, I believe it is. 2014? Yeah. I preached about three or four weeks in the beginning of the year on Egypt. Just ain't all that. Because when, when the Israelis got out of Egypt, they got to one little hard place. They said, would to God we were back in Egypt. They wanted to go back where they came out of. Yeah. Honey, Egypt ain't all that. Amen. After 400 years of whining, bawling, and squalling, now all of a sudden you want to you go back. Can we say stupid on steroids? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> say this with me. Say, I, I am in covenant with God. I live a life with the purpose of honoring and pleasing Him. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the service. We thank you for the word. Thank you that we walk in a covenant with you. And because of that covenant with you, we're able to walk in accordance with your heart, your purpose, and your plan. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Anybody have any needs this morning? You need to be born again? We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address PO Box 7752 Greensboro, North Carolina 27417 If you would like to contribute to our ministry please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button Thank you and may God richly bless you for your giving